Well, hello, everybody. It's Dr. Phil. And so that means you are back on fill in the blanks. And I really appreciate you showing up today. I have a confession to make. I'll just tell you straight up. Today is a guilty pleasure for me. And you'll soon understand why. Because my guest today is Dr. James Kimmel, Jr. Now, he is a lecturer in psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine, the founder and co-creator of the Yale Collaborative for Motive Control Studies, and the developer of the behavioral addiction model of violence. Now, he researches violence prevention, motive control, revenge cravings, justice addiction, non-justice studies, and mental health peer support services. Now, I said this was a guilty pleasure, and before I actually introduce Dr. Kimmel, let me tell you why. I've spent a lot of time in a litigation arena, as you know. He also maintains a legal practice in healthcare law, and he takes a very, very interesting approach to an important topic of violence. He created SavingCain.org, which is an effort to save lives by offering support, resources, and compassion, not to the victims, which of course he has all of those feelings for victims and survivors, but to those considering murder, terrorism, mass shootings. And that is so important because prevention is so important. So I said those considering this, and there are places to go for help. This empathetic guest had the foresight to offer support to assist people that are contemplating revenge or other tragic decisions. And to me, that is very fascinating. I've studied this a lot. I've looked into it a lot, really because of my own background, which we'll talk about later. So welcome, Dr. Kimmel. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me today. Well, thank you, Dr. Phil. It's a wonderful honor and a guilty pleasure for me as well to appear on your show and to spend a little time with you talking about these really vital, important matters that are affecting everyone in our society. Well, every time there is a school shooting or a mass shooting, as is defined by the FBI, and I work with law enforcement a lot, one of the things I get asked frequently when there are these tragic events is, whether or not we can predict and why we don't predict who these shooters are going to be. And the answer I always give to people is, I wish we could, but we can't. We don't have the screening devices. We don't have the psychiatric tests, the psychometric tests, the psychological screening devices that differentiate who is going to do something like this versus who is not. Now, There are some things we'll talk about in a minute that tell us more than most people probably know, but we simply can't give someone a psychological profile of who's going to pull the trigger in a school or a crowded venue or not. But your approach is really not about that. It's about reaching out to these people who may self-identify or come to the attention of authorities or the helping profession in some way and giving them an alternative route to take as opposed to doing that tragic event, you've worked on ways to reach out and give them an alternative route to take, correct? That is true. And, and, um, and we're also shortening that distance between support and interventions that you can have for an individual who's identified and being able to identify an individual. And as I'm sure you know very well, um, the FBI's Behavioral uh, Analysis Unit and the Secret Service have uh, together made dramatic strides over the last few years in coming up with a set of uh, defined circumstances uh, that are common to many mass shooters and and could be applied to just about any uh, murderer. And that list, at the top of that list, Dr. Phil, is a grievance. And what that means is to say is that a perception by an individual that they've been mistreated or wronged or treated unjustly in some way, that is the 
probably the number one common factor for most forms of violence and most forms of gun violence that isn't the gun itself. And what my research focuses on is what is it about a grievance that transforms somebody from a good person into a killer? Uh, and we've made great strides in that area through neuroscience and behavioral studies. Let me ask you something, though, and I'm really doing this because I know you have some good answers to this. So I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. And some of it we don't have answers for, but some of it you do. Isn't some of that analysis, though, post hoc? And by that, I mean, you're right. When we look at the FBI's behavioral analysis group, we look at the profilers, we do know that these are mostly males, almost exclusively males. We know that they're young. We know that they are marginalized in some way, that they've maybe been through a breakup or lost a loved one in some way, that they have some life event that they consider themselves to have been victimized, rejected in some fashion. So those that pull the trigger, that's true of, but everybody that experiences that doesn't pull the trigger. So it's not predictive. Right. And I, what I would say is that it's partially predictive. So it's a piece of the puzzle and there are perhaps 10 or more factors that you need to add to that. For instance, somebody who has a grievance and who's stockpiling weapons and who has already begun his planning process and has been holding this grievance for a long period of time isn't letting it go. When you start to add those factors, you can start to narrow down to a person that needs some form of help and support before they go and commit that act of violence. But it's not a nice and tidy business. It's not a, uh, you know, you can't spend five minutes and go, now there is somebody that's ready to kill and the rest of the people we can exclude. But I think more important uh, is what the FBI and Secret Service are missing. Um, and that's the piece of, of the puzzle that we've been able to provide, which is what happens when somebody has a grievance and what neuroscience, recent neuroscience, brain imaging, fMRI studies are showing is that a grievance triggers a craving in the brain for retaliation, for justice in the form of revenge. That is the new insight that uh, science is bringing to the picture that's showing that grievance triggering retaliation triggers a desire for revenge, for pleasure, for hedonic reward. In other words, the human brain on revenge looks almost identical to the human brain on drugs. That's an important piece. And we can then, if we know people have a grievance and know that they're developing a, an addictive grieving, grievance uh, craving process, we have methods we're developing now to intervene with that individual and take them out of that addiction and break the craving before they act on it in the real world. So if this craving is getting into the limbic system and hijacking the pleasure centers, if it's getting into a loop that can be disrupted, then you're saying that if you can disrupt the craving, then you can disrupt the behavior that satisfies the craving. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yes. I mean, you think about it this way to try and visualize it and make it, make it, uh, help it make sense for you know, your listeners is there's a courtroom inside every human mind. Every human mind has a courtroom in it, you know, and everything's there. There's you know, a judge's bench and there's a table for the prosecution and a table for the defense and a witness stand. And inside of this courtroom, uh, this is where we put on trial the people who offend, wrong, betray, humiliate us. And we do this, humans do this, billions of times a second around the world all day, every day, because we're always running into things that offend or hurt us or victimize us, or that we imagine offend, hurt, or victimize us. Because this is the extra danger to this is that it can just be in your imagination. There's no universal judge that says, oh, your, your offense, yeah, that's, that's valid and this other one isn't. And since we think it's not, you don't carry it anymore. If it's real for you, it's real. And what happens is, is that in this courtroom, you, the individual, the victim, play all the roles. You're the prosecutor, you're the victim, you're the defendant, you're the judge, you're the jury, and sometimes 
you're the executioner. And what that means is it leaves you with a decision. This trial is happening inside your mind, but at the end of the trial, you're going to decide, are you going to carry out that sentence in flesh and blood in the here and now, or are you going to let it go? That's a critical moment. And that's why I've sort of become a lawyer in, who, who I practice law inside the courtroom of the mind now, not uh, only in real courtrooms, because that's where it's all happening before it turns into violence. Well, I want to spend a moment on what you're talking about here, because I want our listeners and viewers to think about this in their own life. They've heard me say a million times that perception is reality. We tend to believe ourselves what we tell ourselves. And I've used the example, if I put a blindfold on someone and walk them around and they believe that the next step they take is off the edge of a 10-story building, they'll fight you like you were trying to put a cat in a sack if you're trying to get them to take that next step, right? They can be on a flat floor in the middle of a room, but if they believe that next step is going to take them off the ledge of a building, they'll fight you for their life, even though reality is different. If they believe it, it's true for them. And that's what you're saying. These grievances can be real or imagined. They may have no basis in reality, but if they have put that victim hat on and believe it, they can act on that, even though it's not consensual. Absolutely. You, you just put that perfectly. And that's exactly what's happening. And that's what explains a lot of what we see in the world, in the universe of conspiracy theory and things where half or more of the population doesn't even understand uh, what the grievance is in the other half of the, of the population. Uh, and one, one group firmly believes uh, that there is either a dramatic threat or there's been a dramatic wrong that's been perpetrated. And they're carrying that as a grievance. And, it, and logic no longer, or I would say, let's talk about it as terms of evidence, Evidence, real world evidence doesn't matter anymore. It's not persuasive for that person because they believe that there is a legitimate grievance that they have. And now that this revenge craving addictive process has begun in their minds. And we're, you know, the train has left the station in terms of logical persuasion. Now we have to go in. And the process that we've developed is to work with an individual like this and we say, let's allow you to try out that entire case inside your own head. We created a, uh, a courtroom of the mind where, the, uh, where it's, it's guided and directed toward a verdict, and we allow the person to experience getting revenge or getting justice safely inside their head before they carry it out in real life. Think of methadone for a justice addict for a moment. That's how we think of it. And when we use this process, we release the revenge craving, the violence craving safely, and allow this person to move beyond it and then come back to us again and consider even the idea of forgiveness, which is, of course, ultimately going to be the resolution of any grievance from the end of World War II to any act of terrorism where the terrorist group finally puts down its weapons to a dispute between a husband and a wife or two children on a playground. Ultimately, the only thing that resolves a grievance and restores peace, happiness, and health is a decision to forgive. And this non-justice process that we've developed is a way of actually systematizing that rather than the current you know, government-run justice system, which systematizes revenge seeking. It does not systematize healing and revenge. You had an interesting life experience I wish you would share that with people because I think we have different points in our lives that are moments where we come to a precipice and we have to make decisions that become life altering. And you talk about a time in your final years of high school when you say you were being bullied and some classmates, I, it just infuriates me to even think about this, but they snuck onto your property and shot your beagle Paula and the police didn't do anything. Talk about your experience when that happened, because I think that sets you on this path. Oh, there's no doubt that uh, it did, in fact, set me on this path. It changed my life. I had two really big pivot points in my life, and that was the first one, Dr. Phil. Uh, 
And just as you said, I had been being harassed and bullied for several years through high school. Uh, and by the time we all, I, I grew up in the, in the country in central Pennsylvania on a farm. And uh, by the time, uh, I mean, these kids were essentially my neighbors, other farm kids uh, out in the country. Uh, but I wasn't a legitimate farm kid in the sense that my dad was an insurance agent. We lived on my great grandfather's farm. So I wasn't accepted into the in-group there. And I desperately wanted to be part of that in-group. I wanted to be a farmer. That's my number one career goal when I was in high school was to be a to be a farmer until I was so firmly rejected by these guys, uh, which was a painful, painful experience. But it culminated one night uh, while we were all home asleep in this, you know, along this one lane country road, uh, just sort of half awake. And I hear a, a pickup truck coming down the road and stopping in front of our house, which is an unusual act in its own right, but it was enough to just grab my attention. And I looked out the window and I could see it once one of their trucks. And moments later, there was a gunshot. Uh, this woke everyone up. Uh, the person that fired the gun ran back, got in the truck, and they took off down the road. Uh, we looked around the house to see if there was any damage, you know, bullet holes, anybody was hurt. No, but no one was hurt. Went back to bed eventually. Uh, one of my jobs uh, on, on our farm, it was a pretty small operation in terms, because we weren't making our living from it. So we had, you know, we had a herd of Angus cattle and some hogs and chickens. And and one of my jobs before going into school in the morning and getting on that bus was to go out and feed the animals and water them and take care of uh, our dog, our, our hunting dog, uh, Paula, the beagle. And when I went up to her pen, I found her laying dead in a, a pool of blood with a, a bullet hole in her head. Uh, which was just the most, as you can imagine, the most shocking uh, experience to imagine. I mean, obviously, humans experience far worse violence than that. Human on human violence and terrible things occur. Uh, but when you're living in the country and you walk upon something like that, it uh, it shakes you. And I can tell you now, in hindsight, as a researcher, that that exploded in my mind a desire. To retaliate against these guys, I wanted justice, and I wanted it absolutely desperately, and nothing was going to stop me from getting it. Well, uh, you know, my, my parents called the state police. They came. These were in the days of things like this and bullying and stuff between kids didn't really matter uh, very much, not at that level. And there, this was well before school shootings had ever occurred, and it was ignored. And uh, two weeks later. Uh, I was home by myself again, but pretty late at night. And they came back. The pickup truck came, and there was. You know, I looked out the window after a, a, an enormous, for me, explosion, uh, where they had blown our, blown our blew our mailbox off its post. Uh, you know, with like a half stick of dynamite. Crazy stuff. I mean, just you wonder what, why, right? Yeah. Well, anyway, that was it for me, and my justice craving was now unleashed. And, uh, you know, I'd grown up with guns all, all my life. We had plenty of hunting weapons in our house. And my dad had a handgun in his nightstand and I grabbed it and I ran out the door and I uh, took off after these guys. Uh, took me a, a good bit of time to catch up to them. I was probably hitting nearly a hundred miles an hour on this country road. And I chased them onto one of their farms and I cornered them by a barn. And, uh, you know, I had my high beams on them, and there were three of them, three heads in the rear window of a pickup truck, and they got out and just sort of stared back at me, dumbfounded like deer, kind of, who's this? Because it took me a while, so they wouldn't necessarily know who it was. They had no weapon. They didn't know I had one. And it was my opportunity to get justice. And I reached down, and I grabbed that gun, and I unlocked the door, and I started opening it. and. Thank God at the very last second, I just had this sort of illumined moment, this uh, sudden awakening that if I killed those three guys and it would have been so easy, you know, I'd have killed me, uh, the guy that I knew I was for those 17 years. And I'd never come back from that. And I might, I might be killed 
physically, I sure would be killed in my identity and my personality. I'd never be the same. I would be a murderer uh, the rest of my life. And it was just enough of an insight uh, to cause me to put the gun back down on that passenger seat and close the door and drive home. And that's when I decided to become a lawyer. <laughs> because, you know, lawyers get justice for free, Dr. Phil, in, in America, yeah. or we think we do. Uh, you know, we get justice without paying for it, or that's the message. And, uh, well, we can go from there, but that's, that's my little journey at that point. What do you think caused you to take that pause when you did? Because it can be two seconds between opening that car door and pulling that trigger. A lot had to happen in that few seconds. I'm a spiritual guy. I was raised, my grandfather was a, a brethren pastor, and, uh, and I was, I've, I was uh, raised, it wasn't even raised. I've always felt like I had a pretty close relationship with the divine. And uh, for me, I felt like that was a divine moment, an intervening moment. I'm not saying that you know, God intervened and saved, saved my life. Uh, but I'm saying that my, my spiritual connection to God was reawakened at that moment, at the last second. And I can't explain exactly what caused that awakening, other than uh, to say that all of my years of, I was raised in a good family. I was raised with a lot of uh, advantages. I didn't have a lot of want. I didn't see a lot of violence. Violence wasn't uh, who my family were, or my teachers. And uh, those things, I think, helped support me in that crisis moment and helped be available. They were available for me to draw upon, you know, at that last second. I often think about, there's a, there's a fellow that I work, actually, there's several uh, murderers, uh, you know, incarcerated that I work with, and they all seem like the other James Kimmel to me. Uh, we, there were, two, it's, it, it, some of them are my, my age right now. And they're, they've been serving 50-year sentences plus. And they had the almost identical experiences. They didn't have a dog shot, but they had some other heavy grievance that they had experienced, some form of victimization that was completely shattering for them. And at the last second, they didn't have that illumination. And it is boggling to me, and it's tragic to me. Uh, that so many people don't have those built-in resources, whatever they are, or that sense of spirituality that's critical uh, to be able to stop. But I'll say even people that have all those resources, they sometimes go right through the red light and they commit that act of violence. And that's why, you know, the new book that I'm writing, which is called The Justice Addicted Brain, uh, the surprising science by be uh, for how good people turn deadly. That's kind of my message: is that it, people think of murderers typically as sociopaths, psychopaths, people with broken brains, people that are de demented, uh, filled with evilness. It's rarely the case, actually. There, that's true. There is a group of people who have. Um, sociopathology that's diagnosable. And if you study their brains, their brains are different from the rest of us. But that represents one to 3% of the population. Most of the violence is not being perpetrated by sociopaths in our world. It's being perpetrated by good people who have a grievance and get caught up in this addictive process. And by the time they've gratified this craving for revenge, and you get high from it. If I would have pulled the trigger, I'd have been as high as a kite for minutes to maybe even an hour after. But after that, I'd have crashed hard the way all drug addicts do. And I would have been left hurting even more than I was before. And yet somehow wanting more of this drug over and over again. It's the most powerful and dangerous addiction in humanity, far more dangerous than drug addiction, because the only way to get high for a justice addict is to inflict suffering upon somebody else. You know, a justice addict uses a gun to inject a bullet. A drug addict uses a syringe to inject a drug. You know, but in this, in the end, these are two processes of making yourself feel better when you're hurt. I always encourage people to test their thoughts for rationality. There are a lot of definitions you can use, but 
I always say, look, if you're having a thought, at least test its rationality. Number one, is having this thought in your best interest? Does it get you what you want? Does it protect and prolong your life? You can use different criteria, but test your thinking to see whether it's rational or not. And if it's not, then generate a rational alternative. If this thought's not rational, if it doesn't get you what you want, if it doesn't protect and prolong your life, then what does? Come up with something that you can put in its place that does. The reason I wanted to expand this to not just those that are thinking about shooting someone, there are so many people out there right now that just in the normal course of their life, as you say, everything's on a continuum. You back down the continuum. People experience this every day, whether it's towards their boss at work, whether they've had something done to them, real or imagined. I wrote a book back in 1998, and I talked about the 10 laws of life, and one of them was there's power in forgiveness. And you said something very important. You said when you decide to forgive, that's a very profound statement, and I want people to hear that again, decide to forgive. Sometimes we sit there and passively wait for this emotion of forgiveness to wash over us. That's not how it works. It's our decision. I've forgiven people that don't even know they ever did anything to me, and I didn't tell them I forgave them. If I did, they would have said, for what? It isn't important that they know. It's important that I know, because if I don't forgive them, then I'm locked in this bond with them forever, back and forth, and if I let them go, then I'm free. Forget that they're free or not. Their judgment day will come later. If ever, they may not have ever even aggrieved me in some way, but if I thought they did, if I can forgive them, I set myself free. That cell I'm in locks from the inside. I can let myself out if I choose, if I decide to forgive and move on. I was so glad to hear you say that. Oh, that's you, you put it so beautifully and so powerfully, and that's exactly, uh, that's exactly the case, and that's the end point, and that's why we call it the miracle court. It's actually a court where when, when you experience, if you've ever experienced, I know you just described it uh, for yourself, but for listeners, if you've ever made that decision that Dr. Phil just described to forgive someone, there is a miracle feeling at that moment. It's miraculous. And the reason it is, is because this thing that was so important to you and so incredibly painful to you that was ruining your life, suddenly, in an instant, in a blinding flash, is gone. That's miraculous stuff. I mean, there, humans haven't figured out a way to perform many miracles, but I'd say every human being, there's one uh, miracle that we uh, have been born, and it is in our true nature to be able to perform at any time, and that's the miracle of letting the past go and setting yourself free. That can be performed by anybody anywhere. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't take any special training. And it's not magic. This isn't magic. This isn't hocus pocus. It has nothing even to do with religion or spirituality. It's just a decision to set yourself free. And when you do it, if you experience it, it is so profoundly joyful and blissful and freeing and relieving. Every The people that go through this court often say, geez, every, it just feels like the weight of the world just suddenly lifted right off of my shoulders. I can't believe it was this easy. I had the power all along, and I thought somebody else did. I work with a lot of exonerees from death row and prison, but the ones that death row, where the stakes are so high, impact me so greatly. And one of these gentlemen recently that spent over 30 years on death row for a crime he did not commit, DNA completely exonerated him. And then all of a sudden, his alibi of not even being in the state at the time seemed to make a lot more sense. Someone asked him, how are you not bitter? How are you not just so angry that they did this to you? And without even thinking, he said, you know what? That's why the rear view mirror is this big and the windshield is this big. He said, they took 32 years 
I'm not giving them another minute by living in the past. It's all forward. It's all in front of me right now. I don't have time to carry a grudge and be upset about what's happened in the past. Maybe I should. Maybe it makes sense. But I don't have another minute to waste. I'm all looking forward at this point. And all of these guys, and they're all guys because there are so few women on death row, all of these guys have such a spirit about them, those that are still on death row, that know they're innocent. There's a man on death row in Oklahoma right now that I am so committed to getting exonerated. His name is Richard Glossop. He didn't commit the crime any more than I did. And he's had his last supper three times. And every time he has shared it with the guards, I ask him, what do you mean? He said, look, they're just doing their job. They're not doing anything wrong. And let me tell you, I don't want to eat alone. (laughs) So he shares this meal with the guards and three times they've gone down there and either had a last minute reprieve once they were going to execute him and they had the wrong drugs. So they said, hey, we screwed up. You got to go back. Then they suspended executions in Oklahoma for a number of years. So he sat there waiting again. Now he's on the list again, and we're working hard to get him off of it. But his attitude is, hey, I know I didn't do it. These guards, I think they know I didn't do it, but it's not their decision. And he doesn't have this revenge loop in his head. He's chosen to forgive everybody involved and just believes that the right thing's going to happen. He's going to walk out someday. It's his choice. He has set himself free, even though he's in a cage. If you had gotten even that night when you had those morons pinned against a barn, I just have a problem with people being cruel to animals. But had you stood up for yourself and been macho that night, we very likely would not be talking right now. Well, you might be talking to me in <laughs> yeah. on death row. Yeah, you exactly. know, that's where you might be interacting with me right now. And that would be a real tragedy. And that's exactly right. Uh, this desire for, I mean, they, we really are up against it uh, in American society where the glorification of revenge seeking uh, at the social networking level on media, uh, you know, movies, you know, superhero movies. Are, an, are, are designed to trigger your revenge craving. They give you a grievance at the beginning. Uh, most, many movies do. Uh, you get a grievance and you, they activate in the audience the desire for retaliation. They string that out for about an hour and 20 minutes or so. And then you finally get your fix. Your, your, you know, your fist is clenched. Finally, the villain got his. You're out the door and they want to bring you back again and, they, and you know where the fix is and you know how to get it. So it happens in video games. It happens in uh, movies. And there's been a lot of discussion about, well, you know, do violent video games cause violence? It's not the violence in the video game that's risky. It's the stimulation of the revenge craving that's risky. The more often you play, uh, the more often you take any drug, the more you're conditioned to it, the more you want it, and the more higher quality and higher quantity of that drug you want. And so the risk isn't just that it isn't the portrayal of violent imagery that, that is, uh, will drive somebody to commit an act of violence. It is, though, this conditioning of an individual who finally gets a real grievance in their head to go, I know what made me feel good in those video games. It's a small step now between that and a real handgun or a rifle or something else. Uh, so we cling, we, and we want that craving fulfilled, and we don't want to give it up. If you talk to a, a heroin addict, and say, hey, uh, sir, how about we, why don't you just do the right thing here and stop taking heroin? They're not going to do it. They're addicted. That's the whole problem with it. So to expect somebody that has a powerful justice addiction or revenge addiction to just give that up, even though you could show that through forgiveness, they will truly experience freedom, uh, is a tough ask. And that's why we're now developing these interventions to make forgiveness easier and help this, uh, you know, as I was saying, methadone for a justice addict, allow them to experience a safer form of this revenge in order to get them beyond it, to start thinking clearly again. And this applies, as you said, Dr. Phil, to any form of grievance. It's not just about violence. It's anything in your life, any family member, friend, uh, employer, uh, the person at the checkout counter, 
uh, the person at the gas pump. It, it just applies everywhere. My question that I'm going at from a different angle is, we talked about what makes a shooter, a school shooter, a mass shooter, or whatever, do what they do from a motive standpoint. What about the motive for bullies? I'm talking cyber bullies. I'm talking bullies in school, social bullies. I've testified before a joint committee on Capitol Hill about cyber bullies and how we need to start paying attention to that and the schools need to take responsibility for it. Do you have an opinion? Do you have empirical data about what makes some of these kids so relentlessly dog on a peer, sometimes to the point that they kill themselves? Yeah, the studies show there is there is a, a good body of data that's now been created probably over the last uh, decade or so uh, that shows that it's exactly the same thing. It is the, the primary motive for bullying is grievance-driven revenge seeking. Now you might go, well, how can this strong kid, how can this you know, tough kid who's the bully in the school, who's beating down on uh, the weaker kids and just doing it relentlessly, you know, what, what, what form of revenge are they getting against these weak kids who have never done anything to him? And, and, and I, before I answer that question, that's the same question that you can ask about mass shooting. How is it revenge seeking if a mass shooter goes out and kills 50 people that he's never met, that never did a thing to him? The answer in both cases is, is that we seek, humans seek revenge by proxy as well as directly. And this is an important thing to think about and know, and I'll give you an easy example of how you can see that. If you come home from work, you've had a bad day at work, and you know the proverbial thing is you kick your dog, or you punch a wall, or you're just mean to your spouse, okay? Why are you being mean to your spouse? You had a bad day. Well, what, what does that really mean? Well, what that really means is, I had a bad day in a circumstance in which I was powerless, and now I'm coming home, and I need to get that out of me, and I'm going to retaliate against for what happened to me at work. I'm going to do that at home with the places that are in a safer place where I can retaliate. That might be having an argument with your spouse or kicking the dog or punching the wall. Well, now apply that to bullying or even mass shooting and you get the same experience. Perpetrators always feel that they're a victim first. Perpetrators see themselves as victims and victims have grievances and they have a desire to retaliate and now we understand the brain biology for what drives that. So what you've got with bullying is typically you'll find that the bullies believe that they're victims in their own lives, victims of either uh, parental abuse, abuse by kids bigger than them in other grades, uh, victims of uh, uh, systemic uh, 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 problems, you know, maybe they're in a a, a terrible neighborhood and a terrible life with no opportunity and uh, all they see is misery and suffering all around them and they see no opportunity for themselves. It could be any grievance, real or imagined. But that is the triggering point. The grievance is triggering the revenge cycle and they are bullying, which is to say getting re revenge by proxy. We've all heard many times of this, you know, Munchausen by proxy. Uh, and you can explain that better than me as a psychologist, but the general idea of that is, is that a parent thinks that their child has, uh, you know, every form of illness and, you know, brings the child to doctors uh, incessantly uh, and trying to prove that the kid's sick when the kid isn't. I, that's just a very colloquial way. You can correct me on that. No, but you, you okay. captured it. Okay. And so, uh, but likewise, we seek revenge by proxy. We don't all, everybody thinks of revenge as you... Revenge only means you targeted the perpetrator of the wrong against you. Definitely not the case. Terrorists, when they light up, when, you know, when those terrorists flew those uh, airplanes uh, into the World Trade Towers on 9-11, there wasn't a person in those trade towers that those terrorists had an individual grievance with. They took out those towers and killed all those people by proxy for grievances that they thought existed and wrongs that they thought America had committed 3,000 miles away 
years earlier. Uh, that's the explanation for that. For listeners, we see that in so many different walks of lives. And while this isn't as true as people think, we hear that children that are molested become molesters, children that are abused become abusers. That's not blanket true. However, if you have a person that is in a situation where perhaps a parent is really harsh with them or they're being victimized in some way and they can't fight back, they can't stand up for themselves, they can't stop it, they don't have a voice, they push that down inside and that rage is going to come bubbling up at some point. That's when you're getting what you're now describing as by proxy. It's going to come up later, and they're going to vent that where they feel safe venting it. They don't feel safe venting it against a father who's 200 pounds heavier and strong and all, but they'll go somewhere that they do feel safe and vent that anger in some way. And if you're in the crosshairs, then you catch the heat. I want people to understand that is not an excuse. It's not that you should feel sorry for that person because you're still being victimized. It's just an explanation that is offered so you understand you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything to invite that. You're just in the crosshairs with someone that has a need to vent something because of what you've been talking about from the very beginning in this revenge cycle. And here's the scary part to that. Once you become the victim of a bully in school, your uh, rate of risk of becoming a bully yourself skyrockets. So victims of bullies often become bullies. As I said earlier, perpetrators always see themselves as victims first. So the data show that if you have been bullied in school, you're more likely to commit a, a, a follow-on act of violence, often retaliatory, and I would explain that as by proxy again. So it creates a vicious cycle where we keep cycling around. The bully creates a new victim. The new victim creates another victim. Each time at each point, that's a new grievance, a new sense of injustice for that person they want to retaliate against that. And you could wind that backwards if you could wind back the, you know, the wheel of time. And you might go back to some fundamental very, very early in their life uh, act of violence or, as you were saying, sexual abuse. I've, I've worked with uh, an individual recently, former Army veteran, uh, after he was released from the, uh, the military, uh, sort of drifted around a little bit. Uh, was filled with grievances from his experiences in Afghanistan, uh, where one of his buddies was uh, killed right in front of him. Uh, but also, it turned out, uh, had been sexually molested when he was a, a, a little boy. And he, after he left the military and floated around a little while, ended up teaming up with the Ku Klux Klan and rose to the second in command of the National Ku Klux Klan. And when I talk to him, he's absolutely convinced that throughout that process, he was addicted, fully addicted to this revenge seeking cycle of grievance and then f making himself feel better by retaliating. The Klan helped him do that. And Dr. Phil, you mentioned there are certain areas, for instance, of society where there's more violence than not. It's not by accident that often those areas are, are, are areas where there's a lot of other addicted addictive processes going on, substance use. Now, law enforcement would say, oh, okay, so it's, it's gang activity, and, it's, uh, it's, and it is. There, it's absolutely gang activity. But the point of it is, when I, I talked to a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, a neuroscientist, and she said, uh, when I presented this idea to her that 30 years of her research clicked into place, what she had been working on is the vulnerable brain. There are certain human beings with brains that are more vulnerable to addictions than other people. As I mentioned earlier, not everybody who takes a drug becomes an addict. Okay, well, what she was putting together is, this vulnerability probably crosses addictions altogether. So if you're vul more vulnerable to substance use disorder, you're more very likely to be also more vulnerable to revenge addiction. 
and revenge cravings. And you may also be more likely, therefore, to be vulnerable to gambling addiction, sex addiction, or any of the other addictions. Uh, so this helps explain why there are certain areas uh, where if, if people congregate and that's going on, you kind of have to go in there and help target the addiction. You can't just go in and arrest everyone. Uh, arresting and prosecution is just another form of grievance creation, right? It's, it's societal retaliation. That's what it is. Uh, we, we're very, you know, we, we're interested in preventing crime for sure. But what we really, what really gets us off and gets us high and makes us feel good is when the bad guy gets a heavy sentence. And that's what that's all about. So you're feeding, you know, you're feeding that revenge cycle at the societal level, which is a very dangerous thing to do. And that's why we continue to have more violence than we want. And we can continue to scratch our heads as to why. Because people need to understand this. This is evidence-based and I don't want to oversimplify this because there's a lot that goes into these conclusions, but understanding the conclusions really inform what you can do, how you can change this in your own life, how you can model this for your children, and what you can start folding into the curriculum in school. So you don't need to be a neuroscientist. You don't need to get into designing what the law should be, but you can understand what you can do in your own life and your own family and understand the power of forgiveness in finding other ways to feel good about this and not measuring your own self-worth by exacting revenge. That's what's so important. People ask me all the time if I think problems are simple. I always say, I don't think problems are simple at all. I think they're very complex. They're multi-sided, multi-layered. But I think sometimes the evidence-based solutions can be very simple and very doable if people will just take some steps in their own life. You've made that very clear here. I thank you for that. I love this app that you've talked about. We're going to put that on our sites for everybody to find. I also want to put savingcane.org up so people can find that as well. Where is the best place for them to find you and all of your research? Yeah, I would I would go to savingcane.org and uh, my uh, Yale. Um, if you Google James Kimmel Jr. at Yale, uh, you'll find me there very simple. I'm the only only one at Yale uh, that's James Kimmel. And I'm not the Jimmy Kimmel, although some people have uh, wanted to confuse me with, with him. Uh, but I'm not nearly as funny or handsome, uh, but I try to do, do what I can. I now know you both, and you're not <laughs> to be confused. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, you know, uh, the, a thing to, I think, for people to really take a quick look at if they're uh, if they know or worried about somebody that might be thinking about violence, is to look at savingcane.org and in particular the revenge attack warning signs there. Uh, it's all laid out very in a, a very simple fashion uh, that the revenge attack or the attack warning signs that the FBI and Secret Service have identified, but then we overlap what you can do about it uh, in addition to calling 911 or the police. But I call this a revenge attack, Dr. Phil, for revenge seeking. Uh, because it's important for us to kind of move away from just a law enforcement approach and really recognize that if, if you or someone you love is experiencing powerful revenge cravings to do harm to somebody else or themselves, that's no different than a heart attack. And we don't, you know, when, when we're experiencing chest pain and the signs of heart attack, we've all been trained, again, public health messaging. We've all been trained to go, hmm, this doesn't sound right. I better jump on the internet. I better take a look at what are the signs? Hmm, do I fit these? What can I do? What should I do? Should I call for an ambulance right now? Well, we can use that same type of approach uh, for violence uh, by thinking of violence as, as the end result of a revenge attack that's hijacked the brain, as you've said so many times here. So that page there gives a lot of quick information, like, a, like the, if you were visiting the, um, if you were visiting the American Heart Association's website for a heart attack, what are the signs and what do you do? Well, here's some information on what are the signs and what do you do if you suspect that you or someone you know or love uh, is suffering from a revenge attack.
And I don't mean the victim. I mean, they're about to perpetrate it. The site is savingcane.org. And we always say, you've heard it a million times, if you see something, say something. I always add to that, do something. That doesn't mean confront someone that you think is armed and dangerous. You certainly don't want to do that. But research tells us that close to 80% of these people that are going to do some kind of a school or mass shooting tell at least one person what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. About two-thirds tell two or more people what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. But yet people don't do anything about it because they either think, well, you know, I don't know what to do or, you know, maybe they won't. I don't want to get involved. You need to get involved. You're not being a George Orwellian big brother or ratting someone out. You could be saving their life and that of a whole lot of other people. If you see these warning signs, if you hear something like that, for God's sakes, take action, do something, but don't put yourself in harm's way. If you think somebody's armed and dangerous, leave that to the authorities to handle. But go to savingcane.org, and there's a lot of information there that you can use. Look, it's up to all of us. I mean, we're the millions and millions of eyes and ears that can step up and do something and make a difference. So, Professor, thank you so much for taking the time to enlighten us about all of this. It is fascinating, even more so than I had hoped it would be, and I knew it was going to be great. So I appreciate you telling us about all of this. We can talk again, hopefully, when your book is ready and comes out. We can tell everybody about that and talk about this some more. I'd love to do that. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share this information with your viewers and listeners. And, and I, I also appreciate your, your, your adding to the information. I mean, you're just such a wealth of information and you are able to translate a lot of this stuff that's, you know, can be feel pretty complex uh, into language that just makes it uh, a, lo a lot easier to understand and can help motivate people. So I appreciate uh, what you're doing and I appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to share this with you. Well, it's important stuff and you make it understandable as well. Let's stay in touch and talk about this again. For sure. Thanks so much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.